We've seen before that if we have a linearly independent set, uh, one reason linear independence is important is because um, a linearly independent set can kind of be used like a coordinate system uh, for its span in the sense that any vector in its span can be written in terms of the vectors in your linearly independent set in a unique way. So that's something that we figured out when we first talked about linear independence. Something that isn't so obvious is that this actually goes both ways. So if we have a, a vector space, and we have, uh, then it turns out that a subset of that vector space is a basis, so a linearly independent spanning set, uh, exactly when every vector in V can be written in as a linear combination of vectors in your spanning set in a unique way. So uh, again, we know this direction already, right? If S, if S is a basis, then a, so if S is a basis, then uh, S spans V because it's a basis, and S is linearly independent because it's a basis. And one thing we know about linearly independent sets is every, uh, for every uh, vector in the span of your linearly independent set, so for every V in the span of S, which again is capital V, um, V, or we can write, we can write little v as a linear combination of vectors in S in a unique way. So again, this is something that we already figured out when we first talked about linear independence. So um, of course, saying that something is true if and only if something else is true, that means you have to show it the other way too. So let's show this the other way. So what what we need to do is suppose that uh, for every vector in our vector space, um, we can write uh, v or we can write v as a linear combination of vectors in S in a unique way. All right, now what we need to show here is that S is a basis. S is a basis for V. And remember, to show that, we have to show two things. So first thing we have to show is that uh, S spans V. Okay. But this is clear because, um, because every, for every V in our vector space, V is a linear combination of vectors from S. In other words, V is in the span of S. <laughs> right? So this assumption is that there's a unique way to do this, but to know that the span of S is equal to V, we don't need a unique way. We just need some way. <laughs> and we have some way, right? So for every vector, we can write it as a linear combination of uh, things from S, but that means V is V is in S, and so that means capital V is a subset of span S. But of course, span S is contained in capital V, and so they're actually equal. OK, so S spans V. We know that. Next thing we have to show to know that S is a basis is to show that S is linearly independent. And how do you show something is linearly independent? You show that any linear dependence relationship has to be the trivial linear dependence relationship. So let's write a linear dependence 
relationship. So that would be the zero vector is equal to some linear combination of things from S. So A1, V1, uh, plus dot, 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 plus A, K, V, K. And all of the Vs are in S. OK, and of course, all the A's are real numbers here. So suppose we have some linear uh, dependence relationship. OK, well, remember what we're assuming about S. We, we supposed that for every V in our vector space, we can write V as a linear combination of vectors from S in a unique way. OK, well, in addition to this way, or uh, there is another way of writing uh, writing 0 as a linear combination of these v's. So we could write 0 is 0 times v1 plus and so on plus 0 times vk. Right? This is another way of writing the vector 0 as a linear combination of v1 through vk. But we said that there was a unique way to do this. We've just written down two ways to do it. And that means that these two ways have to be the same. In other words, a1 has to be 0, and a2 has to be 0, and so on, all the way down to ak has to be 0. Right? And so that means that our linear dependence relation that we wrote down has to be the trivial one. Right? So s is linearly dependent, or independent. All right. So now we know S spans V. It's also linearly independent. So finally, we've shown that S is a basis for V. Right. So what this is telling us, going back all the, all the way to the top, um, what this is telling us is that this property of acting like a coordinate system, the property of a collection of vectors acting like a coordinate system isn't just related to being a basis. It's actually exactly the same thing as being a basis. Now, one nice thing you can do with this is, you know, not just in theory have a basis that sort of is like a coordinate system. You can actually uh, use a basis as a coordinate system, not just as a general idea, but you can physically write down coordinates. Um, and that idea often gets called uh, using a representation with respect to a basis. So if we have a basis B uh, made up of vectors, say, B1 through BK, now I am assuming here that there's only a finite number of them. Um, but if we have a basis for a vector space, uh, that means for any vector in the vector space, we can write, uh, we can write this vector little v as a linear combination of all of these vectors beta1 through beta k. Uh, then uh, these coefficients, a1 through ak, uh, we can form a vector out of them, right? A vector in, so <laughs> this vector in rk, right? And because there's a unique way to write this linear combination to get v, these, uh, this list of numbers will be the only one that represents little v in this way. And so this vector of coefficients is called the representation of little v with respect to this basis. So um, some people write it this way, rep sub b of v, and some people write it with square brackets and, and then a little b here. Notice that we are indicating what the basis is in our notation. And that's because different bases will give you different representations. Um, so to see why that is, let's look at a concrete example. So in R2, um, the one nice basis for R2 is uh, this basis, right? 1, 0, and 0, 1. This is called the standard basis. You can probably guess what the standard basis for any Rn looks like. But this also, C here, this collection of two vectors, 1, 1, and 1, minus 1, this is also a basis for R2. Uh, I'll let you uh, convince yourself that it's a basis for R2. It is. Uh, so uh, 
let's uh, figure out for this vector, 5 minus 3, let's figure out the representation of this vector with respect to each of these two bases. Okay, so on the one hand, basis b. Now remember, to do this, what we need to do is write this vector as a linear combination of those basis vectors. So to find uh, the representation with respect to b, we need to write uh, v as some linear combination, so we need to know what coefficients to choose, some linear combination of uh, the basis vectors in the basis b, so these two basis vectors. Well, our vector v is 5 minus 3, and right, we're pretty familiar with uh, these basis vectors in R2. Probably you can see what the coefficients have to be. So there's 5 and minus 3. Right? And so that means that the representation of v in this basis is right, you take this coefficient, put that in the first entry, and this coefficient, and put that in the second entry. All right. OK, so for this particular basis, right, this is why the standard basis is so nice in R2, or indeed any Rn, because a vector is its own representation, which is especially nice. Um, of course, this can only happen in the Euclidean spaces Rn. Uh, for other vector spaces, they can't be equal to their representation because their representations live in Rn, uh, even if they didn't start out in Rn. But uh, so now let's see what the representation of this vector v is with respect to this basis. So to find the representation of v with respect to the basis c, we would need to figure out what coefficients do we need to get 5, 3 using this other basis. So 1, 1, and what coefficient do we need uh, on 1 minus 1. All right. Well. You can probably see that what's happening here is we're just getting another linear system. So if we put an A here and a B here, we need to figure out A and B. But really, we're, so we're solving a linear system, and we can write down the, uh, it's a non-homogeneous system because this thing over here is not 0. So we can uh, write down the augmented matrix for this system. It's 1, 1, 5, 1, minus 1, minus 3. Right, there's our augmentation column. And then we can row reduce this to uh, figure out what A and B have to be. So I guess first we'll subtract the first row from the second row. So that's going to give us this. And then let's see, this minus uh, this minus that is minus 8. And then divide by 2. Uh, divide by minus 2, I guess. So that gives us that. And then one more step, subtract the second row from the first row, uh, like this. OK. So that means that uh, for our coefficients, a here has to be uh, 1, and b has to be 4. OK. And that means. Right. Remember, to get a representation with respect to a basis, you write down a vector whose entries just are the coefficients for that basis, so 1 and 4. All right. Now you can see that what the representation is depends on the basis that you're using. So that's why uh, this notation for representation has the basis name in it, because it matters which basis you're using. Of course, you know, if you're in the space R2, if there isn't any other context that would make you want to choose a different basis, of course you'd use the standard basis, because then finding representations is, is trivial. You just, the representation is equal to the, uh, equal to the vector. But there are actually situations where the most obvious basis is not a very nice basis. Um, and actually, polynomials is a good case, a good example of that. So. For example, um, in P2, so actually, sorry, I need this to be P1. Uh, so this is the polynomials of degree less than or equal to 1, in other words, the linear polynomials. It turns out that uh, the basis 1 and x, 
which is a basis for this vector space, it's not a nice basis. So I'm going to leave kind of vague why this is a nice basis. The short version is because, uh, so if you remember the inner product uh, of vectors, well, there is a way to put an inner product on P1, and these basis vectors turn out not to be perpendicular to each other, which you can imagine is kind of a pain uh, for a basis to have vectors that aren't perpendicular to each other. Uh, but it turns out that these two vectors, clearly also they're still a basis. They're linearly independent, and they also span. Uh, I guess maybe that isn't totally obvious, but it's true. Um, it turns out that these are perpendicular in the sense of perpendicularity that people have invented for this vector space. So it turns out that this vector, uh, this basis is a nicer basis for various reasons than the basis you might prefer, which is 1x. Uh, so in that situation, uh, right, you, you still might want to know what the representation of a particular polynomial is, say 5x minus 3. Uh, it's going to be harder than just saying, well, relative to this basis, uh, it would just be minus 3 and 5. But we're going to have to work harder because we aren't using this basis because it's not as nice. So let's use this basis. So how could we do that? Well, again, we have to figure out what linear combination of the basis vectors gives us the vector that we're looking for. Right? And notice that I've put these basis vectors in the same order in which they appear in the basis. Right. So 1 is first, and then x minus a half. Uh, this is actually why we require that a basis be not just a set of vectors, but an ordered set of vectors. Because to come up with a representation, we have to know what order the basis vectors are in. Okay, so to find the representation of 5x minus 3 with respect to this basis, we have to know what a and b are. Well, we've solved this kind of thing before. Uh, if we just write, every, write out or multiply everything out on the left-hand side, we get a minus 1 half b plus bx. And this is supposed to be 5x minus 3. But for polynomials, uh, equal polynomials have to have equal coefficients. So our constant coefficient, which is a minus 1 half b, has to be equal to the constant on the right-hand side, which is minus 3. The x coefficient on the left hand side, which is b, has to be equal to the x coefficient on the right hand side, which is 5. And now we have a linear system, right? Uh, lots of problems in linear algebra come down to s just solving some linear system of equations. We could write down an augmented matrix and row reduce, but because we already know that b is 5, it's actually maybe a little easier to just do back substitution for this example. So we know b is 5, so we'll put 5 in here and then move that to the other side. So uh, a is minus 3 plus 5 halves, which is 1 half, uh, one half? no, minus a half, minus a half. All right, so now we know a and b. So the representation of 5x minus 3 with respect to this basis is the vector. Now, this is a vector in R2, but it's the rep, uh, it is uh, a is minus a half and b is 5. Okay, And then often you write, this is a rep representation with respect to b, so some people write a, a little subscript just to remind you that this isn't just some vector in R2. It's a representation for a different vector in uh, the basis b. All right, so the moral of the, the story here, right, the big picture with bases is that a basis determines a coordinate system, which determines a representation. Now, uh, what we're seeing here is that uh, by doing this, if, if we have a basis with a, f if we have a, a basis that's finite for a particular vector space, its representation actually makes that vector space look pretty much like Rn. And when I say pretty much, we could actually formul formalize that quite a bit more. So it turns out that any uh, linear relationship between vectors in V actually produces a corresponding relationship in Rn via uh, the representation with respect to that basis. And that linear relationship in Rn still holds. So uh, having a representation sort of uh, 
as long as you ha as long as your basis is finite to begin with, uh, having a representation is sort of a, a way of turning uh, questions about your vector space v, which might be confusing in some way because who knows what this vector space looks like. It lets you translate those into questions about Rn, and Rn is a vector space that we understand a lot better.